Honored to be here tonight. Y'all, I know, I know the temptation of weather. Uh, it was like raining for an hour. We're like, oh, probably shouldn't go to church tonight. Uh, trust me, I, I want to sit on the couch sometimes too. Like there is, I love, I mean, I, part of the reason I wanted to have kids is because I wanted to have someone to watch movies with me that can watch movies that I want to watch. So I raised them up right. I got them watching 90s movies and it's a, it's a blast, you know, some of the oldies but goodies. They know all of the movies that a lot of us grew up on. So anyways, that's a whole other thing. But anyways, I wanted to watch some movies with my kids, but instead I sought the Lord and I'm so thankful. I will say this, you will never regret getting in the presence of the Lord. Hear me on this church. You will never regret getting in the presence of the Lord, but you will regret choosing not to go to be in the presence of the Lord. The times often, you ever heard from your friends when you miss a church service and they're like, oh my gosh, the Lord showed up and people were getting wrecked. Like, dang it, I missed it. Anybody that ever happened to anybody? All right, yeah, me too. It was like every single time I ever missed a church service was the day. I'll never forget this one time. They're like, Miles, you'll never believe it. They did an altar call on this woman in the back row. She got out of her chair and she crawled her way up to the altar because she didn't feel worthy enough to stand. I was like, I missed the best parts. The ones that I was there for, though, is like when the person in the front was like, they had a demon and you're praying over them, they throw up all over the floor. Like, Miles, can you get the napkins? I'm like, sure, I'm here for this one. The demon puke napkins. They're real, okay, it happens. Oh, goodness. Well, y'all, um, I'm excited because, yes, tonight is church and we're gonna get into the word, but I'm also excited for what today marks because starting tomorrow, what are we doing, y'all? Yeah, some excitement out there. We're doing a six day fast. And uh, if we could throw that graphic, oh, wow, you guys are faster than me, goodness gracious. I want us to all join together for the next six days as we pray and fast. Who was here when uh, the prophet Frederick was here? Raise your hand, wave at me, let me know who was here. Okay, just so I know who need to catch up. All right, awesome, beautiful. So he came in and he was sharing a word from the Lord over this house and he spoke something that I believe the Lord wants to do here because we've always prayed this prayer for Freedom House that it would not be about any man's name, it would not be about any church's name, but it would be about the name of Jesus and Jesus alone. And the greatest way to accomplish something like that is we get out of the way and the Lord shows up only in his way. And that looks like miracles, signs, wonders, healings. And this is the very thing that Frederick was prophesying over this house, that these things were going to be coming out. Uh, and I'm not just going off of the word of prophecy, I'm going off of the word of God. Okay, Mark 16, Jesus says that he will go and he will work with us as we're preaching the gospel and he will follow us with signs and wonders. So he always, always confirms his word with his way. It's really beautiful how the Lord works. He doesn't let anybody second guess if it was him or if it was not. So some of the things that were spoken over us that we're gonna be uh, joining in and locking arms as we fast together was miracle signs, wonders in this house. It was also wait for the Lord, take heart for six days, fast and pray for the ministry and training of miracle signs and wonders. I don't know about you, but has anybody ever prayed the Lord would do a miracle? Yeah, no, okay, if you haven't, it's because you haven't had anybody around you that needed a desperate need that only God could heal or move in that moment, okay? But I'm telling you, when you start praying those prayers, you will see the Lord work in ways that you've never seen him work before. I wanna live by faith, guys. I don't want to live my life unspiritually. You ever hear people say, I don't want to over-spiritualize things. So do you want to under-spiritualize them? You want more fleshly than spiritual? I don't know about you. I want to over-spiritualize everything. We are in a spiritual warfare. It's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spirits. I want to make sure that I am doing and following the Lord the way that he wants us to follow. And I believe that there is something powerful about when the Lord does something that only has his name on it. Because when somebody gets healed, it doesn't matter who touched and prayed. It matters that God touched and they got healed. I believe we're gonna see that happening here. And, and a couple of things that were spoken was we are not fasting for the church, but for what the Lord is going to do. In other words, we are not fasting for our benefit, but for his glory. Hear me on this church. Too many times when we start a fast, people say, well, what are you fasting for? I'll tell you what I'm not fasting for, myself. I'm fasting for his glory. Okay, if I was fasting for myself, I would be eating every day. And that wouldn't be a fast, it would be eating. You guys with me? 
It's not for ourselves, it's less of ourselves. He said, the Lord is going to speak sudden things. People are going to come out of this fast and they are going to preach. The Lord is going to do things and our only response will be to preach about his goodness. How many of you wanna see the Lord show up in a way that it's gonna cause you to talk about how good he is, yeah? A few of you, come on, anybody else? How many of you wanna see and taste the goodness of the Lord? All right, we're gonna have to wake up. I know it's cloudy today, guys, get over it, all right? It's November and it happens. How many of you wanna see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? Hallelujah! We need some shouters up in this place. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Oh, goodness. Thank you. Answer prayer. I'm fasting for a louder church. Whew. Best way to start a fast, communion, because you're eating. Go for it. Okay? Take a bite. Take a sip. The word that was spoken was change. The Lord is going to change it. And I know that can seem like a blanket statement, like, okay, change is coming. But the change is for us as individuals to go from hearers to doers, to go from hearers of the word to doers of the word, and for the Freedom House to go from information to encounters, where it's no longer just hearing about the word, it's eating the word. Best way to eat the word is to stop eating food and it'll create this hunger in you that can only be satisfied by him. I know y'all are super excited about fasting. It's going to be great. If you want uh, some biblical information, go to Isaiah 58. You don't have to do it right now. Just write it down. Isaiah 58, uh, verses 6 to 12. Uh, the scripture is actually, it starts right there. It continues on, though. Uh, if you guys are going to probably get a text later tonight with this graphic, because I want everybody to have this. Uh, if you're like, how are you going to text me? Go ahead and text the word freedom to 972 Eight three three zero 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 three. It'll come up later at the end of the night. Um, but if you text the word freedom to that, you'll be put into our database just to hear about what's going on. And this text will be sent to you. Uh, and if you need that number or that graphic later on, just see us at the front table. We'll take care of you and get going. But one thing that was spoken over this house was that the Lord is going to bring emotional, physical, and spiritual healing. How many of you guys want that? You ever had a low day? You ever had a low week, a low year? A low five years? Yeah. <laughs> Some of us have been there, okay? Many, many times. We call them dry seasons just to be really nice when really it just sucks, you know? It's, it's not great. Let, let's get real for a minute. Um, but I believe, I believe that as we partner together in unity as a church and we say no to our flesh for six days, it was almost like I saw it where it was like every day was like the next thing the Lord was going to reward, reward. Every day that I pressed on, okay? I'm not saying everything is tied to fasting, but there is a fast that the Father desires and he wants to loose the bonds of wickedness. He wants to break every stronghold. Basically, a fast that the Father desires is freedom. And I believe that in these things, we will see freedom, freedom from and freedom for. Freed, freed from some of the things that have hurt us and freed for the things that God is calling us into. And I believe as a body, we're gonna partner and see these things happen, amen? Amen. All right, open up your Bibles. Back to Genesis. This is great. We're gonna keep going back to Genesis. I love this. Genesis chapter six. Actually, you guys can go to chapter eight. I'll share one quick thing from, from chapter six. We are going to be talking about Noah and the flood, but we're gonna, we're gonna kind of jump in right after the flood. You know, when you read the word through the lens of I'm trying to discover who, who this God is, you could read the flood and think wrath of God. But when you know him as father, the way that you read the flood is not wrath, it's steadfast love. Because what you see is the patient love of the father who waited as long as he possibly could until he said, every thought and intention of man is evil right now, except one family and that's with the father, Noah. He waited until literally it got down to one family and it wasn't even the savior, Jesus Christ. That's how long he waited to see, will they turn back and come to me? We call it wrath because the earth got flooded. I call it patient love of a father. 
And maybe that's hard to understand, but I really do believe that the Lord's love is patient. In Genesis 6, verse 18, we'll jump to chapter 8 here in a second. God is speaking. Uh, tonight, what I want us to do, we're taking communion. Uh, as many of us know that when, when Jesus sat down with his disciples for the Last Supper, they took the first communion. And this, he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. There was an old covenant. Now, many people would go through the Old Testament and try to figure out what's the old covenant. Is it 10 commandments? Is it when he spoke to Abraham and said, you're gonna be the father of many nations? What I wanna do tonight is I wanna talk about the first covenant and the last covenant. Somebody tell your neighbor, first covenant. Perfect, glad you guys are curious. Genesis 6 verse 18 says this, God is speaking to Noah. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you. Now the word covenant, sometimes we cheapen it and we just call it a promise. Yes, it is a promise, but it's much more than that. It's almost like a binding agreement promise between one man and another, or in this case, God and man, God and all creation. So a covenant is more like an alliance than a promise. It's not just saying, I'm gonna do this for you. It's saying, we're going to do this together as one. It's coming into unity under a promise. So it's an alliance, it's a pledge. It's not just from God for us, it's between God and us. And what's beautiful about this is he invites us into the covenant. So now we know the first covenant of the Bible is with God and who? Man, specifically? Oh, Noah, okay, good. Just making sure we're paying attention. Here we go. Genesis chapter eight, starting at verse 20. This is after the flood. They got off of the ark. The word says this, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, for those of you who are wondering, well, if he just got off the ark and he's killing animals already, how are they gonna, how are they gonna reproduce and make it, you know? Uh, what, we're, what we're taught in Sunday school is that they, they went out to the ark two by two, right? Well, they did, but the clean animals, they went two by two by two by two by two by two. There were seven pairs of every clean animal, okay? There were seven pairs of every bird. The unclean animals, there were only two, male and female. You guys with me? Go back and read if you would like to do some homework. It'll be great. And then you can come tell me I was right and I'll feel good about myself, okay? It'll be fun. So this is what happened. He, he gets off the ark. The first thing Noah does is he builds an altar and he starts making sacrifices. One of every animal he gives to the Lord. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. When I was reading this, I almost felt like I was reading, this is gonna sound wrong, forgive me for a moment. It felt like I was reading the humanity of the father but it wasn't the humanity of the Father, it was the person of God. Think about the way he's, he, he just get this, gets this offering after he floods the whole earth. He says, I'm never gonna do this again. I know the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer or winter, day and night shall not cease. What's amazing about this is it was when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma that he said these things in his heart. It was when the Lord smelled the worship of Noah that he was moved in his heart to make a promise and declaration and enter him into a covenant. I share this because oftentimes we don't think we have the ability to move God whatsoever but you are his child and it moves him when you do things. Think about when Jesus was on the earth, he was moved multiple times. And most of the time it was by someone's faith. Other times it was lack of faith. And that was a different kind of move. That was more grief, grief. But you can move the Lord with your worship. Do you guys know why I, I shout so much and dance so much and then I call the church into worship? It's because the Lord is moved by it. He's worthy to receive it, amen? He's worthy 
I don't need someone on the stage to tell me that he's worthy. I read my Bible and it shows me he's worthy. So when I come into a place and I know he's there in that place, then he will get my praise. He will get my worship. And I know that even when I'm not feeling something, because you know, many times we come to church, I just didn't feel worship. I didn't feel his presence. Well, is he going to feel anything if I'm not worshiping him? I care more about how God feels. And I'm not talking about emotions. I'm talking about being moved. I'll tell you this. When I walk into a room, I don't want to be the one that doesn't move God's heart. Imagine getting face to face with Jesus. And he's like, man, every time you worship me, it was only because someone led you into it. It was never me. You ever think about that? Jesus should be your worship leader. The Holy Spirit should be your worship leader. The Father should be your worship leader. We put too much pressure on people on a stage. Let's keep reading. Chapter nine. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Sound familiar? The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Everybody that loves meat should shout amen right there. All right, yeah, I'll see you at Hutchins after this. It'll be great. Thank God for brisket. See, what's amazing here is that what's happening is he gets off the ark and not only is God reestablishing the first command, which was be fruitful and multiply, but he's also giving us more. Whereas Adam and Eve, no wonder they messed up and sinned. They were vegetarians. I felt so bad for them. They were just eating fruit. I would have been angry too. I'd have been like, well, give me that fruit because I haven't had that one yet. Maybe it tastes like meat. Nope, that one doesn't either. Now the snake comes out. Oh, okay. The sin of humanity was because of that. I'm just kidding. That's not true. If you're a vegetarian, God bless you. It's okay. You're, You're good. I still love you. But you're eating my food's food and you need to stop, okay? But here, God takes it one step further. He's like, hey, I'm gonna reestablish my first command. And on top of that, I'm gonna say, yes, you can eat the fruit of the land, but also you can eat the animals too. Amen, thank you, Jesus. Let's move on. It doesn't make sense, by the way, why why they get more after the whole world was evil. And now all of a sudden God's like, I'm gonna give you something more. That's called grace. When you receive what you did not earn or work for, it's called grace. God's kindness that was unmerited, unearned, and undeserved. This is what he shows to Noah. Hey, this time around, I'm going to give you more. Why? Because I love you. Literally, that's the only reason. You didn't earn it. I'm giving it to you. That's why it's a free gift of God. So let's move down. Stay in chapter 9. We're going to go to move down to verse 8. Get some clarity here on the covenant. It says, Then God said to Noah, and to his sons with him, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud or my rainbow in the cloud that it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. What is so beautiful here is that oftentimes we think of the rainbow, like, yeah, that's God's promise. So it's like for us, it's only for us, right? We see the rainbow 
And what do we think? Okay, there's not some huge tsunami coming to crush us and drown the whole earth again. Thank you, Jesus. Every time I see that rainbow, I can just know there's not going to be a world destruction apocalyptic moment that's about to happen. Yes, that is true. When we see the rainbow, we can trust and know, okay, the Lord is not going to flood us this time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But what I love so much about this covenant is that he doesn't just say every time you look and see it. He says, when I look and see this rainbow in the clouds, I will remember my everlasting covenant and I will not flood the whole earth. It's the father's way of saying, when I look at the rainbow where there should have been destruction, there will be life. That's my promise. When I just look, all I have to do is look at it and I will remember my covenant. Oh, this is the gospel. If I just look at this, I won't do this. There's so much here, I promise you. But even before we go deeper, I want us to go to the end. Let's go to, let's go to Revelation really quick. Go to Revelation chapter four. It'll be on the screen if you, if you can't flip that fast. I just love hearing the sound of pages flowing. It's great. Revelation chapter four. Verses one through three, this is John having the revelation of heaven. He says this, after this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, and this is the voice of Jesus, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was what? A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. You see, when God said this is an everlasting covenant, he didn't say that lightly. He was saying in my throne room where I reside at all times, there is always a rainbow and it's around, meaning every direction I look, I will see the rainbow. And when I see the rainbow, I will remember my everlasting covenant with my children that where there should be death, I will bring life. Where there should be destruction, I will restore. This is the gospel of Jesus right here in front of our faces. It's so everlasting. Look, go even further. Let's go to Revelation 21. Come on, we're almost in the definitions of the words. Revelation 21, everlasting covenant, ready? Verse one, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I know all you ocean lovers, maybe you picture heaven with an epic ocean, I don't know, but the word says the sea was no more. I find this so interesting because what the Lord is doing is he's saying in the new heaven and the new earth, there is no sea, meaning there's no more fear that one day I will be getting mad at this heaven that I've created and flood it. There's not even a sea to do it with. I find this so interesting that even in heaven, the Lord has a rainbow surrounding him at all times so that he will never forget his covenant as if God would forget anything anyway. He places it there so that we can see and hear and know God remembers his covenants. Where I should have been destroyed, God remembers his covenant and says there will be life. Now let's make it real. Go back again to the Old Testament. Go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. to start in verse 4 and read through verse 9. Just trust me on this. We're going somewhere. The word says this. This is when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they were acting a fool. It says, From Mount Or, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? 
for there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to flood you this time, but I am going to send dragons. I mean, fiery serpents, guys. You tell me what that is. Go to China, okay? I'm the year of the dragon, 1988, okay? Every 12 years, the year of the dragon. They must have been around because he sent them to take care of the Israelites. Right. But much better than flooding the whole earth, right? Right? You guys would rather have dragons than flooding the whole earth, right? Unless you can swim for a really long time, okay? Just making sure. Okay, I don't know. Guys, they're probably uh, poisonous snakes, okay? They called them fiery. They had fiery mouths. But I think dragons are cooler, okay? We're going to go there. And every nerd said amen. Thank you. So the Lord sent dragons among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Oh, see, here's the difference. The first time around, nobody came back repenting to the Lord. So the whole earth had to be flooded. Now there's a little bit of repentance happening here. Oh, sometimes the Lord will allow things to happen in your life to lead you right back to him. Why would Satan do this? And what if it was the Lord allowing this thing to get you right back into his presence? Sometimes you should thank the Lord for hard times because it leads you right into him. They said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. They even recognized what they did. They had some self-awareness. This is huge. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. Oh, there were snakes, not dragons. Sorry, guys. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would just look at it and live. Do you see the covenants and the promises that God makes with his people? He says, look, you don't got to do much to get back to me if you would just look at it. The rainbow, if I just look at it, I'll remember and I'll give you life and I won't destroy. The serpents, you're going to die from the poison if you just look at it. Here's where it gets really real. Go to John chapter three with me. Starting in verse 14. <laughs> oh, Jesus. He's talking to Nicodemus right now, who's having trouble believing and understanding spiritual things. He's probably telling Jesus, stop over-spiritualizing. Can you just make it make sense to me? And he's like, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't even understand these things? He continues on, starting in verse 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. All you have to do is look at me and believe, and you will have everlasting life. Why? continue reading for God so loved the world that he doesn't want to flood it again <laughs> he so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life you see the everlasting covenant happening before our eyes continue on go to John chapter 12 could have gotten it because I could not have figured out how to work so hard to figure out how to get your grace but you gave it to me that all I have to do is look and believe and that is enough for you Jesus I'm thankful Lord we as a body are thankful for the grace of God for your grace for your mercy we're thankful for your patient love that you waited through not only creating the world and then flooding it and starting all over again with a family, but you went through those who were impatient, who complained, who were bitter, who were unfaithful, who left you, who left their devotion of their youth. Lord, you waited thousands of years and you continued your patient love all the way until today so that I could be with you forever. And I say, thank you, Jesus. 
hope, oh Lord, restore the joy of our salvation. That we don't come to church asking for more, we come thanking you for what you've done that I could never have done. I'm thankful, Lord. When the cross is no longer enough, kick me out of this role, Lord. If I have to preach something else, remove me, Lord. We are thankful. We are thankful. We are thankful. Let us stop complaining about what we don't have. Oh, the food's not good enough in the wilderness. We're, we're mad about it. No, let us stop complaining about what we don't have and start thanking you for the breath of life that is in our bodies as we breathe right here in this place. Let us thank you for your presence that also lives within us right here in this place. That it no longer requires us going and visiting a temple, but Lord, you said your bodies are a temple and they've been bought at a price. And they have, I've given you my Holy Spirit to live within you. Now you are my temple. So wherever you go, I'm with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All we have to do is look. All we have to do is look. Oh, I believe if he can get our attention in this room, he'll get our hearts. He'll get our lives. If his, if his everlasting covenant could get our attention, he'll get my everlasting attention. He'll get it. Jesus says this in John 12, verses 31 and 32. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. God sees the world, he sees all of its evil, and he says, if I just set a rainbow up and I see it, I'll remember my covenant with my people, that I will not destroy them. Jesus says, hey, if, if I'm lifted up, and how did Jesus go back to heaven when he was taken up? Riding on a cloud, just like a rainbow. I mean, goodness gracious, how's he coming back? The same way that he went into heaven. You see, the Lord is saying, when I am lifted up, the eternal everlasting covenant is seen by all. And when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people back to myself because that's his heart from beginning to end. The first covenant to the last covenant. His desire is to redeem and restore and bring back his people to be with him forever and ever and ever. And I'm not talking about awaiting heaven. I'm talking about living heaven with the presence of the Lord already dwelling within us. Because eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life is when, yeah, when your flesh dies and you become alive in Christ Jesus. But that, that already happened for many of you in this room. Eternal life is this, knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. It starts with knowing and intimacy with the Lord. This is the everlasting covenant. Here's what's powerful about this. Is that the word says in Galatians 3 that when you are united with Christ in baptism, in a baptism like his, you put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Okay, follow me for a second. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Christ. He doesn't see you, he doesn't see your past, he doesn't see your sin, your failures, your mistakes. He sees his son, he sees Jesus. Why? so he can fulfill his side of his everlasting covenant. All I have to do is just look at him and I won't destroy, I'll bring life. All I have to do is just look at Jesus. It's why Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Why? Because when the enemy comes before the Father, before the throne, accusing the brethren of their sins, all he has to do is look to his right hand. And when he sees Jesus, he says, I will not destroy. He hears the sin, I will not destroy. He hears the sin, they will not get death because you've already conquered death. All he has to do is look to his rainbow, and that is Jesus. Jesus. I 
used to get mad at the LGBTQ community for taking the rainbow. But in a strange way, I am so thankful that it's the rainbow so that God can see it and remember his covenant with man, that he desires life. And I know for some of you, like, this is strange. When he sees his rainbow, where there should be destruction in our minds, there will be life in Jesus. For everyone who calls in the name of Jesus, where it says everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. The most beautiful part about every covenant God gives us is that he invites us into it. He invites us to partake into it. And this is what happens if you go with me to Luke chapter 22. We'll end on this. And I'm going to give you guys some time with the Lord. But in Luke 22, this is the last supper and the last covenant or the new covenant as Jesus calls it. Luke 22, starting in verse 14, the word says this. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying this cup, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the son of man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Jesus, he gives them the bread of his, his body. He gives him the, the cup, the, the wine, which is his blood. And he said, this is poured out for you. It's the new covenant in my blood. And this is so that we can be too covered by the blood of Jesus. This is why the word says we enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus and that he opens up the curtain for us, which is his flesh. We come through him so that we can look like him so that when God looks to us, he sees Jesus, not us. So that when I come into his presence, I don't have to be coming in by my guilt and by my shame, but by his blood and his gospel and his covenant. This is good news for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord and believes. For everyone who says Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead. For every single one, this is good news. So that I know that when the Lord looks to me, I don't have to hide in shame because I know I wasn't the greatest this past week. I can look to him and he can look at me and see, I see Jesus. I don't see what you didn't do for me. Because I remember my covenant, I don't keep record of wrongs. I remember my covenant, I choose not to remember sins. This is what the word says in Jeremiah 31. This is what the Father chooses. So now, when he was pouring out this covenant of his blood, he was saying, I'm not just pouring it out, I'm covering you with this. So all the Father has to do is look at my blood and he will say, give him life, give her life, eternal life, eternal life. I thank you, Jesus, today for your blood. Every covenant, there was blood involved somewhere. The restoration of mankind, there was blood involved. The restoration of mankind for all time, once and for all, there was blood and it was the blood of the Lamb of God. But we say, thank you, Jesus. Maybe if we could keep our eyes on the cross and what you did there, we would stop worrying about what we don't have or where we've been offended or where we've been hurt by man. And we'd start saying, I've got all I need. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.